just entered the theater of an alien sky. If the words and images seem strange to you, there's a reason for this. Our world was once a vastly different place. To experience this won't hurt you, and there is nothing to fear. In these discourses, we've proposed that our Earth was formerly joined in a close congregation of planets, unlike anything observed today. Based on converging evidence globally, we can name the gathered bodies and identify an extraordinary correspondence between celestial events as seen from Earth and a massive outpouring of myths and symbols, all inseparably linked to the rapid rise of the ancient civilizations. In the final analysis, the only reason to accept or even to consider the reconstruction presented here is predictive ability. If the claimed events occurred, would we reasonably expect the unique narratives and sacred forms coming down to us as worldwide or archetypal content? Our overriding advantage in this respect is specificity. Since none of the concrete patterns revealed to us are predictable under today's common assumptions, not a single one. And yet, all are concretely and specifically predictable in the light of the reconstructed polar configuration. With this episode, we will begin enumerating the polar configuration's predictive ability in broader terms to lay the groundwork for the episodes to follow. The history of recorded human thought began with the myth-making epoch. Enigmatic symbols and magical practices told a story of creation, catastrophe, and regeneration of the world. Of course, the greatest mystery of all is the very existence of the mythic archetypes or common themes. We can count them by the hundreds. Why did every ancient culture declare that the sky changed, or that towering gods once ruled the world, then went away? Such mysteries invariably direct our attention to deeper and progressively more specific questions. Why did the world's first astronomers so consistently name the great gods as planets? What was the meaning of the so-called great conjunction or perfect conjunction of planets said to have marked the beginning of time? And not only that, the planet Saturn as a primeval sun. How did the planet Venus earn its worldwide identity as the mother goddess? Or the planet Mars, its global reputation as a great warrior? And what was the nature of the world-altering catastrophe said to have ended this celebrated epoch? Like hundreds of other mythic archetypes, such themes never make sense when referred to our present sky. Always they speak for things not seen in our own time. How did this disconnection occur? We can follow the archetypes across all of human history as associated art and mythic imagery, sacred narratives and countless magical practices take us back to a lost age of gods and wonders. What was the human experience that provoked this ground floor human memory? Reconstructing the ancient experience requires systematic cross-cultural comparison. That is how we come to recognize different myths and symbols pointing back to the same events, all occurring in the earliest remembered time. Within this framework, it's only to be expected that an urgent collective memory would grow fragmented and confused across the centuries. Towering forms in the sky progressively lost their cosmic dimensions to become legendary ancestors of those telling the stories. Even the most powerful memories slowly gave way to localization, every tribal community on Earth declaring its possession of the original story. In this way, each regional culture could cling to a proclaimed lineage of divinely ordained kings of world-conquering warriors and radiant mother figures. 
Competitive claims of this sort lie at the heart of all localized mythic rhetoric. One effect amongst many was the incessant drive towards regional expansion through wars of conquest. Always the so-called holy war was animated by a perceived divine mission descending from the gods themselves. This universal fact will become a key in our analysis of the warrior hero theme. But there's more to this historic pattern. All of the broadly distributed archetypes bear identifiable relationships to remembered cosmic events, to appreciate the impact on humanity. The events themselves must be brought fully into the light of day. In our own time, historians and comparative students of religion can only explain world mythology as a carnival of pre-scientific ignorance. The specialists just assume that they understand what our early ancestors did not understand. But that explanation ignores hundreds of global patterns that would not even be possible in the absence of extraordinary natural events. The truth is that expertise will lead nowhere in the absence of understanding. The great myths arose in an age of planetary instability and cosmic violence, including close approaches of planets and earth-shaking electrical exchanges between planets. The conclusion in these discourses is that our world, our sky, has not always been the stable referent we experience today. The events that inspired a transformation of human consciousness were cosmic. These events are not occurring now. Hence, it is futile to look for answers in the appearance of the sky today. The present is not the key to the past. Allow for another vantage point and everything will make sense. But of course, a new vantage point requires that common assumptions be suspended to allow the tests of predictability. Of the hundreds of archetypes we've previously named, how many would be expected under today's assumptions? Not a single one. Would you expect the ancient stories of a former central luminary or primeval sun different from the body we call sun today? Would you expect the preposterous location of that body at the celestial pole? Or expect the ludicrous identity of that very luminary with the remote planet Saturn? Our advantage is that every tenet in this reconstruction carries explicit, testable, and inescapable implications. Once named, the archetypes leap out at us. And as the archetypes are named, so are the implied relationships to other named archetypes. This fundamental unity, the ground floor of the human experience, is for us the acid test, drawing us into a critical examination of the causative events without which no archetypes could even exist. The goal is to identify the unified substructure of human memory. The process starts by naming the cross-cultural themes and allowing the implications to shine through. If indeed a common memory lurks within the historical record, the historical detective must first distinguish between the archetype and its localized expressions. Always keep in mind that the ancient tools of remembering invariably became agents of forgetfulness as well. That's because no local symbol, no mythic fragment, no magical reenactment could even begin to capture the full integrity of the original experience. No particular myth could possibly lead to any reliable conclusions as to things actually seen in the sky. The truth is that regional storytelling always fostered more forgetfulness than remembering. And yet, through systematic cross-cultural comparison, something deeper will reveal itself, a dependable integrity hidden in the underlying points of agreement, where an astonishing archetypal accord begins to shine through. In fact, every logical conclusion to be discussed in these discourses will follow simply and directly from three indisputable facts. Firstly, no archetype follows logically from any natural events observed today. Secondly, all archetypes are provably connected to each other. No isolated archetypes exist. And thirdly, a unified explanation is available to us if we allow the archetypes to speak for natural events not occurring today. We have named the celestial provocation as the polar configuration. 
By giving attention to the impact of these gathered planets on human imagination, all of the recurrent themes become witnesses to a story told around the world. And that means hundreds of archetypes hiding in plain sight.